We have a treat tonight. Scott Buck, he's going to talk about the 150th uh, steam up down at the Nevada State Railroad Museum. Scott and I were able to travel down there for the 4th of July and spend some time there and on the VNT on a couple of private uh, layouts that we got to see. We saw railroads in Reno. We saw uh, railroads at Portola. So Scott has loaded a whole bunch of slides up for a presentation. I've been talking with Bob Kenworthy, who is also down there. Um, so Scott's going to give his presentation. He'll take some breaks at certain spots in there to ask questions, answer questions, whatnot, have other comments. If you think of something and you would like us to know about it, put it in the chat box and we'll monitor the chat box for him. That way everything will get captured. And I think without much more, we're gonna give this over to Scott. We're gonna mute everybody. So Scott, you'll need to unmute after we do that. Okay. So, Brian, have you done that? Looks like yeah, everybody everybody's muted except Scott. Okay. Right, I'm still good. So I'll go to screen share. Share. Okay, I got to do one more thing here. Okay, can you all see this? Yes. Yes. Okay, and you can hear me okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is about Scott and Greg's Nevada adventures, you know, happened from, I think it was June 29th to about the 5th of July. Um, first of all, I want to dedicate this presentation uh, to all those individuals and groups who acquire, restore, maintain, and operate vintage locomotives, rolling stock, and other pieces of railroad history. Also those who are employed by and volunteer at railroad museums and tourist railroads. I spent 20 years as a volunteer at, at Nevada State Railroad Museum and two uh, steam railroads here in Washington. And that is not an easy business. If it wasn't for volunteers, those trains wouldn't be running for the most part. And even the people who are paid that restore these things, they don't get rich doing it for the most part. So if it wasn't for them, those trains would not be around for all of us to enjoy. I just wanted to bring that up. So about late, I think it was about late last year, about this time, the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City announced they're gonna do the Great Western Steam Up. Now I had personal ties there. I had volunteered there on the crew from uh, 1990 to 1996 before I moved up here. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to go because sometimes it's hard to go back, you know, a place you left so many years before. But last year, you know, they had the steam up at the Coombridge and Toltec, and I was bummed about not about missing that. So Greg and I talked, we decided to go. So a uh, couple of things about our trip, kind of our stats here. It was seven days, four states, drove approximately 1,500 miles, visited three museums, and I think maybe the outside of one or two more, one tourist railroad, 23 steam locomotives, 10 that were either in operation or at least under steam, several diesel locomotives, operated on one layout, visited another, and visited two hobby shops. So we left on, I believe it was June 29th, headed down I-5 early in the morning, stopped at Roseburg uh, at the hobby shop there, and went over the mountains to Klamath Falls. We had figured that Klamath Falls was about halfway between here and Carson City, so that was where we stayed both going down and coming back. So after we checked into the hotel and got dinner or before dinner, uh, we had noticed this locomotive on a prior trip, but on that day it was too rainy. I didn't want to get out of my car to take pictures. So I made sure I took some shots on this one. This is the form as you can see Southern Pacific locomotive built in 1906, I think it says there. And this was probably, a mainline locomotive in its day, but several of these ran in the 1950s, mostly in branch line and, and local service. And this one's been very nicely preserved. There was a plaque there of people who had donated to it. As you see, it's very well protected both from the weather and from vandals. Couldn't get any better pictures of it just because of the trees and everything. Uh, we also discovered, and I think Greg knew about this because he had uh, 
been in Klamath Falls several times. We found a little museum that was closed, but on the outside there were some displays, including a uh, former where I'm pretty sure it's a warehouse or a caboose. Then we decided to go to Portola the next day. There's the uh, Western Pacific Railroad Museum in Portola, which is in Eastern California. And the museum was started in the early 1980s. I don't know the whole history, but there was a group that wanted to uh, preserve the Western Pacific Railroad, which was absorbed by the Union Pacific about that same time. And I don't know again what the arrangements were, but they're able to get the old facilities in Portola. And this is the former Western Pacific, now Union Pacific main line here. And I understand at one time they had a roundhouse here. There probably would have been locomotive changes because the trains came up the Feather River Canyon and they had a pretty probably level run through Nevada out to Salt Lake. And uh, once steam, they uh, dieselized fairly early the Western Pacific. So roundhouse was torn down, but they built the diesel shop there. And they built a loop, which I understood uh, was to uh, turn snow plows. So somehow this group got a hold of the diesel shop, the loop, and they started the museum. I'm guessing Union Pacific was pretty generous with them because they had a lot of locomotives. They do Western Pacific, Union Pacific. Um, first time I visited there was in 1987, and I had not been there since 94, so it's kind of fun to go back. Uh, they have a big variety of uh, switchers. Uh, you can see from uh, four different manufacturers here, and I think they also uh, might have a Fairbanks Morris switcher. They have road switchers. Uh, some WP, like this one's painted back in one of their color schemes. This one was off, I can't think of the name of the railroad in Eastern Oregon. There are a couple of bald ones. They had a couple of Alcos off the uh, Kennecott. In fact, the first time I was there in 87, they were, it was rail fans day. They were running trains around the loop for photographers. And one of these things was smoking worse than a lot of steam engines I've seen. And they also have a DD40X. They've had their, had that up there for years. And even though the cab is pretty stripped down, you can still go up there and see what it's like in there. It's really cool. They also have quite a few F units. The Western Pacific used F units both in their, uh, freight operations and their passenger trains, which was mainly the California Zephyr. They didn't have E units or Alcos like a lot of the railroads did. So I think there's three F units, three or four F units there. I'm trying to remember. Uh, some are in the 900 series were the last freight engines they used in the 70s. And there's one is restored. I think that's 805A, which I believe was on the California Zephyr. Of course, they have a lot of cabooses. They have some steel ones that are in better shape than these that they use them to haul passengers around and they give rides around the loop you can ride in the caboose it's a pretty cool place so if you like diesels you gotta go there and of course one reason we stopped was uh, they've been talked about years getting the steam program going there and they finally got a hold of this west former western pacific 165 and only uh, five WP steam engines have been preserved, surprisingly. And when Greg and I were there, the guys were there getting this ready to fire up the next day. And I guess they saw they could trust us and the guy invited us to go past the barriers. And we had a long talk and, talk, and he went over all the struggles they went through to uh, acquire this, to rebuild it, all the money, all the time. It originally was, I think, in a park down the Bay Area somewhere. So it wasn't under steam that day, but I was able to go onto the internet and find a picture of it taken uh, under steam one day. And this was the first year they've ran it, I understand. It wasn't a great picture, but that's all I could find on that. So it's good to see they have some steam going, which will, of course, make the public happy as you see that going. Um, before we go any further, I want to do a little bit of background for those that don't really <clears throat> if you know much about the Virginian Truckee Railroad. In the 1860s, and my dates may not be accurate here, these are kind of estimated. It was a big silver boom up here in the hills of Virginia City. And uh, it really grew very quickly. Uh, the mines were up in the mountains and mines needed supplies. Uh, the biggest thing needed was timbers because that type of mining 
you need to use a lot of timbers and there's probably a couple forests buried under the hills up there. And uh, also they needed to get other supplies up. They needed to get the ore or the concentrates down to the river and eventually out to the world. So of course with horse teams and mule teams and maybe oxen teams, that wasn't that efficient. So probably about 1869, Virginian Truckee Railroad was formed and they ran from Virginia City down to Carson City, which is the capital. Uh, shortly after that, they extended to uh, Reno where they met up with the Central Pacific Railroad. And years later, I think about 1900, they built south to Minden, which is an agricultural area. And I know there's sheep down there, so they shipped wool out and maybe live sheep and probably some cattle and other crops also. Now, like most mining activities, the booms go to bust pretty quickly. And the mining pretty much, it never died out, but it really decreased by the 1890s. The VNT had purchased several locomotives. I don't even know what the count was. A lot of 440s and 260s. Some were sold off, you know, when they didn't need them anymore, and but some were saved. Uh, kind of give you an idea, uh, 1937, they abandoned the uh, Virginia City branch, it's no longer needed. Uh, they ran the rest of the railroad until 1950, when it was no longer profitable, that was abandoned. So back to the locomotives, they'd saved maybe about eight of their locomotives, uh, probably for sentimental reasons, along with most of their passenger cars some going back to the 1870s. About that time, the Hollywood started making Westerns and they wanted steam locomotives in their studios. And with Save These Engines are, most of them were purchased by the studios and you know went down to Hollywood, Southern California. Uh, when the railroad abandoned in 1950, also was left was uh, one steam locomotive number 27, two coaches and a caboose. At the same time, there were those in that area who wanted to keep the memory of the Virginia and Truckee going. And this had been going on for years. So finally, they developed and opened the Nevada State Railroad Museum about in 1980. Uh, originally, it was called the Virginia and Truckee Museum, and they changed the name to encompass all Nevada railroads. Meanwhile, about that time, the studios were no longer making westerns. Those engines and cars were surplus. So by various means, they made their way back up to Carson City. And uh, one group called Shortline Enterprises, they acquired a lot of these, this rolling stock. They had a lot of it over on the Sierra in Jamestown in the late 70s. And most of it ended back up at Carson City, the museum. Uh, some pieces have been restored, many haven't, but luckily they've all been preserved for all of us to enjoy. Um, I want to do a, uh, I wanted to have an overhead of the Carson City Museum for those who've never been there. I tried Google, the satellite view was too much clutter. So I got this and they basically have the, ori the original annex or the engine house here. They have the shop here. They have the interpretive center here. There's a turntable and there's a loop of track. I don't know if it's a perfect circle like that, but then tracks take off from each side. They go down what they call the hole. So you have a Y there and a loop. They have the uh, depot from, Southern Pacific Depot from Wabuska, Nevada. They brought over and restored it. They have a replica of a VNT uh, square water tank there. So generally like the trains we route, rode on at the steam up, it would run around the loop. A lot of times during the regular summer runs, at least when I was there, they take off from the depot, do a couple loops, go down to the hole, run the engine around bring it down to the depot. So the engine would be going forward one trip, back one trip to kind of even the wear on the drivers. And one group I want to get a plug for is the Friends of the Nevada State Railroad Museum. They are the support group of the museum. They supply all the crews that run the trains. I believe the volunteer around the museum, in fact, I know they do. Uh, the museum has a handful of paid employees but the friends fill in and they really do a lot. They help with fundraising. They put on, uh, Bob was talking earlier about the symposium they do every October, which I haven't gone in many years, but they have seminars in the morning by experts on Nevada Railroad history. They have a nice banquet and they also, they do run the trains that weekend and they give shop tours and updates of what they're doing there.
So they're really a great organization. Now, does anybody have any questions to what I've covered so far? Is anybody still awake? Uh, can you hear me? Sure can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yes. Say, say, Scott. Uh huh. Those um, those locomotives, the diesels you showed back, the the uh, Baldwin's. Uh huh. You had a picture of the of the uh, Oregon and Northwest caboose. Yeah. That, that line, those that line ran from Seneca to Hines, Oregon. Oh. And those Baldwin's. Um, I'm glad to see they're there. Somewhere I've got a picture of them when they were parked in front of the uh, the uh, the engine house, um, and I've got another picture of them too. So I'm, I'm I'm glad to see that they're there. They're they're beautiful looking locomotives. They've been there for several years. I needed to get I would need to dig out my slides, but they've been preserved pretty well, and the caboose needs to be repainted, as you can see. Yeah, it looked it looked a little gnarly. Yeah, but, well, that's good. Yeah. Okay, anything else before I move on? Okay, so um, I believe it was uh, we arrived in Carson City the night we came from Portola, got a good night's rest, and went down to the museum. Uh, we paid premium price to get in early and greeted us was this engine here. Uh, I'm going to kind of go over each engine, then a little bit about it, and then show some other pictures. This is the known as the Dardanelle and Russellville number eight. It was built by Cook in 1888 and was originally built for some railroad in the Fort Worth and something, I can't remember the name, but spent a lot of its years at a short line in Arkansas, which I think may still be in existence, called the Dardanelle and Russellville. It's reported that it hauled the first train of troops from Arkansas to fight in the Spanish-American War. Now this engine was there for several years and in the late 1930s, they filmed one of the Jesse James movies on location there, the one with Tyrone Power and Henry Fonda. And they used this engine and the studios liked it. So they took it back, to, bought it, took it back to Hollywood and used it in the movies. It was acquired by a company, I think I mentioned Shortline Enterprises. They turned into an oil burner, did some maintenance work on it. It surprisingly went up to Virginia City in 1976 when the uh, revised, we'll call it, Virginia and Truckee Railroad started. We'll talk about that later. Ran one season there. Went down to Jamestown, California on the Sierra in 77 or 78, I think it is. Ran there until 79 on a few excursions and some movie trains. Went to the California State Railroad Museum and uh, operated there in 81 when that museum opened. Uh, went up to Carson City, probably in the 80s, they bought it from Shortline. It was also 1994, trucked over to Portola for about a month where they ran it on weekends. You know, groups from the Nevada State Railroad Museum went over and ran it for them. And uh, so it's kind of been around. Has kind of a special meaning to me because uh, my dad worked on it when it was over on the Sierra, both as a brakeman and I believe he fired it once. And up at the Nevada State Railroad Museum, I worked out as a brakeman off of it and fired a few times and even ran around the loop a couple of times. So I'm sorry to see it's not in service. I understand it just needs too much work to get it steamed up again. And it's not a historically significant Nevada engine. So I doubt if they'll spend the money on it, but hopefully they're keeping it inside to preserve it like it is. And it served as a billboard again for this event. So I'm gonna go over each of these and this is kind of an interesting thing. Virginia Truckee's first engine, and I, I should have had a historic picture of it, was number one, the Lion. It had this huge stack, a funny looking tender that sloped down. It was built by Booth in 1869, which I think was in San Francisco. And I understood it was hauled up by wagon up to Virginia City. Scrapped in 1890, or maybe I might have mistyped, but I think it might have been 99. But anyway, some group or some individual back east decided to build a replica of it. I guess the kind of fell through, and now it's in Carson City. 
whether they're going to finish it or not, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if they have scratch built the whole thing or if the drivers came from something else, but it's just kind of interesting that they would build a replica of something like that, but I guess we'll see where it goes. Now the VMT, uh, I don't know the exact number of engines that have been preserved, but we're going to see all but three of them today, or two of them actually. Uh, one of them, which is in the California State Railroad Museum, the number 13, which if you've been there, it's the one that is on display with all the mirrors around it. And another 260, which is in the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. So all the rest of them were together for this weekend, except the 27, which we'll show some pictures of anyway. And some of these engines had last been in the same vicinity, maybe 80 or 90 years ago. So it was a reunion of uh, steam locomotives. Uh, before we got started, uh, we talked a little bit about the Reno. The Reno's in 1872 Baldwin, went to the movie studios, went to a place called Old Tucson in Arizona, which I don't know much about it, but I believe it was like an amusement park and they used it for uh, movies. And it was abused pretty bad from what I've heard. Then when they could no longer steam it, they hooked up a air compressor so they could run it a few feet at a time. I understood they put a hole in the boiler so they could pipe smoke into the smokestack. And then it was almost destroyed in a fire. Uh, when I started the Nevada State Railroad Museum in 1990, there was talk then of trying to get it back up there. But locally, uh, somehow they got it back up. I understand about September of last year and the group, uh, they're going to try to restore it to operation. I understand they're going to build a building stored in even if they can't restore it to operation, at least it will be preserved. It was really neat that day when Greg and I were there that there were volunteers there shining the brass and it's good to see them, people have that kind of passion for something like this. And you look inside, a lot of the appliances are still there. This one had been modernized up until probably the 1920s as an oil burner with air brakes, although it still had the old Lincoln pin coupler. Next one is the Genoa, which is the VNT number 12, 1873 Baldwin. I believe this went to the Railway Locomotive Historical Society Pacific Coast chapter. I'm not sure. I do know VNT last used in the 1920s. It was never converted to oil like some of them were. And it ended up at the California State Railroad Museum. I'm not sure if the Pacific Coast chapter of the Historical Society still owns it or if the museum does, but if you've been in the Sacramento Museum, you would have seen it in there. It's inside of a truss bridge they built. I was surprised they got it out of there. I was really surprised it was up there, but apparently they can get it out. And I understand what I read on the internet, it's on two-year loan to the NSRM. Next up is the Dayton. The Dayton was built in the Central Pacific Shops and it's on a two-year loan. It'll be go back, it's probably back in Sacramento, which is appropriate since it was built a couple hundred yards somewhere. It'll be on display. It uh, when they, it was acquired by the Nevada State Railroad Museum in the probably late 70s, early 80s, they had looked at doing a full operational restoration, but it had what's called a lap scene boiler, which maybe somebody explained that, you know, during our break. I'm not, I really don't know what that is. And it wasn't legal to, you know, rebuild it in operation. So they wanted to preserve as much as possible. So they did a, a cosmetic restoration. Back to probably the day it came off the floor. You will notice there are no brakes on the drivers. There are brakes on the tender wheels, which are controlled by a handbrake up in front here. It has to be controlled by a brakeman where the fireman would jump down. There was no air pump. So he had no train brakes when this came out. And of course, Lincoln pin couplers. J.W. Bowker also came by way, I believe, of the uh, Railway and Locomotive Historical Society. Uh, there were two of these like this. There was the Bowker and the I.E. James, which was scrapped. And I believe this left the V&T kind of early. And I think it went to a logging railroad who maybe used it for fire patrol. You can see they have a pump up here. It uh, also has been at the, at the CSRM for several years, cosmetically restored. Uh, it's up there, I guess it'll be on a two year loan to the Nevada State Railroad Museum. One, this is probably about 30 years ago in Sacramento, 
there are a couple of docents up on the cab and you actually could go up on the cab and cool little engine would be fun to see that thing running someday, but I don't think that's in the plans. And also you notice the VNT, they're not only numbered, but they're named all their engines up until the last three or last four they had. Now the Inyo, I don't have a be really a better picture of this, you know, taken on this trip, but the Inyo, they decided to restore that to its 1890 something appearance. So it had air brakes uh, for the train that is, train brakes, has a single cylinder pump. Again, no brakes on the drivers. Tender brakes operated by a handbrake. And I remember the one time I got to ride in this up there, they had a brakeman uh, stationed on the uh, handbrake, you know, and they want to slow down going downhill on the loop. In order to run it, I think they've reduced it to 75 pounds pressure on the boiler, just because it's an old boiler. And they steam it up for special occasions. It's pretty cool to see that thing run. Next up is the VNT number 25. Um, they VNT ordered three their three last new engines in the early 1900s were all 10 wheelers from Baldwin. This was built in 1905, originally as a coal burner, later converted to oil a few years later. It went to one of the movie studios and came back. I remember it about 1971 going through Carson City and seeing that the cab was pretty bad shape. The whole thing wasn't. They restored it to operation and it runs on a regular basis down there now. And uh, again, that was one of three 10 wheelers they bought. I believe that left the VNT in 1945 and went to one of the studios. So it's one of the last ones to be on the VNT or last of the older engines, that is. Uh, just as an FYI, the 26 and 27, the 26 was there to the end of operation till it burned down the uh, Reno Roundhouse about two weeks before the end of operations. They scrapped it, but the 27 you'll see next. 27 was the last new engine they bought in 1913. It remained in Carson City after the railroad abandoned. I remember when I was a kid, seeing it out in the north end of town with two passenger cars. It later was uh, up in different places. It was up in Virginia City. I remember seeing it up there and going up in the cab in 1971. When I was at the NSR at Nevada State Railroad Museum, they finally arranged to get it back down there. They were gonna do a full restoration. In fact, I have pictures of it all in pieces with the primer coat on, but for some reason they couldn't do an operational restoration. They restored it cosmetically. It's now up at Virginia City at the, uh, they built a nice little museum for it. Unfortunately, that museum was closed that day. So we couldn't get any pictures. And this is a picture I borrowed from the internet. I'll promise I'll give it back when we're done. But this was probably right after they restored and they really did a nice job with it. It was only a cosmetic restoration. Let's talk some narrow gauge engines right now. Um, we have the Glenbrook and the Empire here. The Glenbrook I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. Uh, excuse me, the Eureka, I said Empire. You've probably all seen this. This is the Eureka Palisades. It ran on several railroads. It became a movie engine. It was acquired by Dan Markoff, who was, a, was an attorney in Las Vegas in probably the late 80s, early 90s. He restored it with his own funding a debut at the uh, California State Railroad Museum in uh, Rail Fair 1991. It's operated on the Durango and Silverton, the Coombers and Toltec. It's been here at the SNMR, NSRM a couple times. It was under steam, but I, it never took it out. So I don't know, you know, it was, I, I heard somewhere he doesn't want to run it a lot anymore, obviously because the thing's old, it's been around, restored for 30 years. So. Anyway, it's, it's a beautiful engine. And again, these are all built in mid 18, 1870s. So Baldwin must have been pretty busy in those days building these engines. Now we're going to talk about the Glenbrook. The Glenbrook was built at the Carson and Tahoe Lumber and Fluming Company in 1875. Uh, that was the company that was on the east side of Lake Tahoe. I don't know the exact how it worked, but they hauled timber to a certain point. I think they hauled it by incline at the top of the mountains. They flumed it down to Carson City, and a lot of it was used for the mining timbers and the mines. 
the engine went to a couple different places. I believe they, uh, it was a railroad that ran from Truckee to Lake Tahoe. It was a narrow gauge to haul tourists down there. It was used there. I don't know where it went from there, but I understand, and I, I haven't seen this in writing, but it went to the Nevada, the Nevada County narrow gauge in California at one time to be used for parts. It was rescued. It was purchased by, I can't remember the family name, but the descendant of the family that owned the lumber mill donated the state of Nevada was placed on display in front of the Nevada State Railroad, excuse me, the Nevada State Museum about 1950. And kind of a sideline here, when I was a kid, we, I grew up in Sonora, California, which is on the west side of the Sierras. And about once a year, my parents and I would go up to Carson City. My mom liked to pull the arms on the slots. My dad would play some keno. But my main thing was to get to go up in the cab of the Glenbrook. It was fenced off, but you could go up in the cab. Plus, they had a couple other displays there. They had a former uh, SP narrow gauge engine, you'll see. And they also had it, the old VNT caboose was there. So anyway, the museum acquired this about, first time I visited a museum in 1983, it was there. And my understanding was they, were, they had to get a new boiler. Somehow a measurement was done wrong or something, but it was an inch off of what they could use it. So they weren't sure what they're gonna do. They either built another one or they restored the original one. And the one they built went over to the uh, Nevada City, California, the museum over there. And you see there, and this was just restored last couple of years, they've done a beautiful job. This one for the, those of no steam engines, it had a crosshead pump. Days before they had the injectors, they had a pump and work off the crosshead to get water into the boiler. And I talked to the docent when I was up there and explained they also had to, to make it legal to put an injector in. Apparently the air brakes were not there when they brought it out of the factory because they operated on the Cumbres and Toltec on that one week, you know, last year they had to put air pump in. But it is a really cool engine, especially since I saw it, you know, kind of in its raw form over about over 50 years ago. Now this is, I can't be sure of this, but I believe is built the same specs as the Glenbrook. Uh, it was also built for, for the, uh, oh, I can't think of the name of that, the uh, Carson Tahoe Lumber and Fluming Company. Probably went to a couple different places and up in the Nevada County narrow gauge, which was over in Northern California. Those who don't know, is a narrow gauge interchange with the Southern Pacific and Colfax, California, which is off of Interstate 80, ran north to the Grass Valley in, in uh, Nevada City, was abandoned in about 1940. And this was purchased by them. I, I don't know the year for sure. And after they were done with it, it became a movie engine. They have a neat little museum up there that Greg and I talked about at our presentation three years ago, where they're trying to revive the history of the Nevada County narrow gauge. They have a lot of West Side Lumber Company equipment. Not a lot of Nevada County narrow gauge equipment left except for this one. And they hastily restored it. And it doesn't look much like the Glenbrook, but the Glenbrook is restored to, we'll go back to it too, when it came out of the factory. Uh, the Tahoe was restored to what it looked like when it was in service in the 20s. Converted to burn oil, had air pumps, had uh, dynamo, you know, electric lights. Didn't get to see it run on the loop, but I got to see it run down. It took on fuel just to the right of here. Uh, Nevada County, excuse me, Southern Pacific narrow gauge number 18. I believe this and two others are built for the Nevada, California, Oregon Railroad. And they ended up on the Southern Pacific narrow gauge, which ran on the east side of the Sierras in California. And this and the two sister engines ran until the late 1950s. And this was uh, placed in a museum in Independence, California, off of Highway 395. A group acquired it a few years ago, restored it. It's been, it was in Durango for a while. They got to run it there. Uh, Durango and Silverton, you may know, is converting over to oil burners. I understood they use this engine tra to train crews. And it was up there. Uh, it's been fully restored. And of course, it was under steam, as you can see there. 
Antelope and Western is privately owned by a family near Roseville, California. I think it's kept up at the Nevada County Narrow Gauge Museum now, but I'm not sure. It's a wood burner. I don't know its history. It was under steam that day, but they never took it out on the loop, at least from Greg and the two days we were there. It was kind of a neat little engine. Santa Cruz Portland Cement Company, the Chigan. And, uh, for, and it wasn't named the Chigan because this rubber chicken you can see here, which has been around the NSRM for at least 30 years on different engines. But this engine was retired in Northern California off of Highway 99, just north of Stockton on the east side of the freeway was a cup place called Pollardville, where this guy had a chicken dinner restaurant, hence the name of chicken. He brought in a bunch of old buildings in the 1960s, built like a ghost town. And this engine was on display. It was painted all like green and red. I used to go by there on my way to and from college in the mid seventies and I stopped in and saw it once. And it was acquired by Staffy Pappas, who some of you probably know. He uh, was at Mount Rainier Scenic for a while. He was at the uh, Northwest Railroad Museum uh, for a while up there. Then he was at Coopers and Toltec, and I believe the California Western. He's restored this. He's taken it several places. And of course, he, he ran it all weekend up there. Yeah. Well, of course, it's a standard gauge. Uh, Bluestone Mine and Smelting, I just noticed 1916 High Surf, owned and restored by a group called the Roots of Mo Motive Power in Willits, California. Again, I don't know the history. I just know it's pretty hefty for a two truck high slurn. Again, it looks really be in pretty good shape, restored really well. Two other engines there, the uh, Joe Douglas was built for a uh, railroad out, I think by the Sutro Tunnel, which is east of Carson City for the mines out there. Uh, NSRM, I'm not sure when they acquired it. It's been cosmetically restored. It was in the interpretive center when we were there. They used to truck it up to Reno to one of the malls for the Christmas holidays. I don't know if they do that anymore. And the Cortez Mining Company, the Anne Marie, I think that's based out of California in the Bay Area. Greg and I saw it once, but then they took it back inside. I don't know what the reason was. I know they do steam in California. As you can see, it was under steam here. I got this picture off the internet, so I don't know much about this, except I know it was obviously Cortez Mining Company where it was, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, just a little bit, they have a very nice interpretive center. They opened in 1990. They rotate displays there. And uh, this is just, I'd like to show you all the equipment, but I really can't. But this was a, uh, it was Virginian Truckee's coach number 17, reportedly built by the Central Pacific or acquired by the Central Pacific and was a promontory as a private car of the big four, or at least some of the big wigs. And uh, this was even still rolling when it was over on the Sierra in the 1970s. They used some movie service, but as you can see, they've had to use uh, boards to stabilize it. My understanding is they're not gonna do a, they're not gonna do a restoration, but in, a re I guess, arrested decay, they call it. You can see where they've taken some of the sheathing off, I mostly just want to keep it original instead of rebuilding the whole thing. This car over here is originally 1870s. Some of the hardware may be original, but the wood's all a replication of a house car from that era. It could be used as a box car, a ventilated box car, or a stock car. And uh, they've run it before at the NSRM. It doesn't have air brakes, and the brakeman would be riding up with the brake wheel to when he had to apply the brakes. And there's some other good stuff in here. The McKean car was mentioned uh, prior to I started my presentation. That's in here, along with a couple other pieces. Just a couple other exhibits. They had uh, an old steam pumper from Virginia City. They had a ladder truck. I think this is from Reno, but I'm not sure. They have some displays going. Narrow gauge train rides for everyone. They switched these engines off. They had the Glenbrook. They had uh, the NSRM has built two special cars, probably when they got the Glenbrook going to uh, haul passengers around. And by the way, this whole loop is, and the whole place is dual gauged. 
originally was built a standard gauge. They dual gauged part of it in the 1990s. Now they dual gauge all those things. They can run both narrow and standard gauge trains. And this car, I'm pretty sure, is the one from the museum in Laws, California. It was a, uh, I think, a Carson, Colorado car, but somebody can correct me during our break. They either had a fire or an accident burnt that took the clear story off, and they just went ahead and rebuilt it. It's a flat top. Kind of reminds you of the man, old man to a Civil War combine. And standard gauge train rides for everyone. They had the chicken out quite a bit along with the Heisler. Uh, the NSRM has two of these. They were called tunnel cars. They're built on top of flat cars and they have platforms on top so the workers could work on the tunnels. And they've been restored as tourist cars. I think they were rebuilt in the last few years. Uh, car number 10, which is original v and I think built in 1873, probably was rebuilt several times, but it now appears as it, when it was a second glass car to haul the miners around. Instead of the cross seats, it has bench seats on each side, has a coal fired stove, which they light up for the Christmas for the Santa trains. Uh, the caboose back here was a uh, former Nevada Copper Belt caboose, the V&T acquired when the Copper Belt closed down in the late 1940s. It's been restored in Nevada Copper Belt. They've also put in seats to all passengers. And they call this a demonstration railroad, just to kind of give people a taste of what it's like to ride behind a steam engine. Uh, every locomotive deserves, deserves a good turn. They took several out. They had a speaker at the time, talked about each engine as this was going on. Uh, this turntable is scratch built replica. I understand they measured the one in Laws, California to build it. It is hand operated. Uh, I've operated it before. One person can turn it light. Steam locomotive takes about three, two on one end, one on the other, as long as the locomotive is perfectly balanced. Just a couple of shots. So these are taken from the front, looking back to where the shock barrier is, you get a view of the engines. Hope I'm not going too fast on this. Couple more, there's the Glenbrook, the Genoa, the Glenbrook and the uh, Eureka. We got in early if there were still a lot of people here, this was such a big event. Another shot I got, a couple more I got of look at the engines from the side. Wish I could have got a picture of the Genoa, but I just couldn't get it under the right light. There's so many other engines there. Uh, the Bowker and the uh, Dayton. And here's the outside of the interpretive center. Questions? No questions. So <laughs> Nothing so, to up in the chat. Clint, photograph. Ask a question. Mute yourself. Uh, Pardon me. I, I, I've been going through all my railroad books here, and I've been having a good time. Um, from uh, Mal Farrell's SB Narrow Gauge, I actually had him autograph it. Oh. Uh, you want to know about Caboose 401? Yes. Combine Caboose 401 was built by Carter Brothers as a coach for the San Joaquin and Sierra Nevada and came to the Owens Valley in 1904, was used in work train service. The car was photographed at Oeno in July of 46 with trucks proclaiming V&T Carson. The car was rebuilt as a Caboose 401 and the picture shows it at uh, Keeler in March of 48. In 1952, the car was again rebuilt and had lost its passenger trucks and acquired a flat roof. At the time Mel did the book, the car was on display at Laws. So it is the same one then. Yep. Thank you, John, for confirming that. You're very welcome. Anything else? Any other questions? Either I'm very informative or I'm putting you guys to sleep, one or the other. Uh, this was a Picture I took at Potola. 
in, in the background on my photo. Uh, okay, I'll look at that when we're, when we're done. So uh, we're getting near eight o'clock, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on, uh, talk about the rest of our days. So the following day, uh, Greg and I tried, we decided to go to the museum on two days, on Friday and Monday, but needed things to do on the other two days. So Greg contract, contact their friends of ours, friend of ours in Reno, who comes down often, uh, John, I can't remember his last name. He uh, comes down to Sound Rail and Ole Ops. Uh, Greg asked him to come up and operate on your layout, or do you know of any? He said he'd be out of town, but he knew of a place we could operate. So and we were set to go there at one o'clock. Greg and I drove up to Reno early and Greg was a little interested in the uh, Nevada, California, Oregon Railroad. And I know very little about the history, but it was built from uh, Reno, narrow gauge up through Eastern California. The original plan I read was to get it to the Columbia River, but it got as far as Lakeview, Oregon. I think it abandoned in the 30s. Uh, most was abandoned. Uh, the part between uh, Reno and uh, the WP was actually standard gauge for the Western Pacific Reno branch, which I believe is still intact and still in use on the south end, because Greg and I did see where they were serving some industries there. So we thought we'd try to find the, uh, the depot, the freight house, and the uh, shops. Now, we parked our car. This wasn't the kind of area I want to be... It wasn't a bad part of town, but it wasn't a part of town. I didn't want to be seen carrying an expensive camera around. So I got these off, off of uh, Google Maps or Google Street View. This is the original depot. It looks like a very nice restaurant now, very nicely preserved. And the bottom picture here is, we're pretty sure, was a freight depot. We never, I don't know if we ever found the shops or not. We found about where they were which is pretty, pretty close to where the former SP shops were. So we had some more time to kill. We want to check out another attraction. The town of Sparks is just east of Reno. They're kind of like twin cities. And there's a little museum there. The museum didn't open until one o'clock. We had to be at our op session at one. But at least we want to see the outside. So they have a little deep, well, I don't think this is a replica of anything, but this neat, they built it. And on display, they have a, one narrow gauge locomotive, two SP cabooses, one you can go through, it's been restored. This one I think is storage. And I think this was an SP, it was a business car, I think SP. So we arrived there and even though it was before the time, there was a docent there in a conductor uniform. He saw us, let us in early, gave us a spiel. And you saw the SP narrow gauge 18, this is the number eight, a sister engine. And this engine uh, I know was on display in Carson City in the 60s, because when I was with my parents, when I was like nine years old, we saw it there. It was all fenced in, you couldn't get inside, but that time all the appliances were still in the cab and I fantasized about getting in the cab of this thing and running it somewhere. Well, I didn't get to run it anywhere, at least I got to get in the cab of it. I could go in the cab, most of the appliances are gone, like the injectors and everything and the lubricator, because Dosen explained one place they had it, it wasn't protected, the vandals got a hold of it. So this is it here, and the third engine in the series, number nine, that's on display in Laws, which is a little museum. Uh, again, that's in Eastern California off of Highway 395. I was there in 1978, but haven't been there since. But anyway, that accounts, and luckily these three were preserved. Here we have the uh, business car. Here we have Gregory Wright, president of the Republic Consolidated Mining Company in his private car. So the layout we went directed to is a fellow named Jim Petro, or Pete Petro, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Really nice guy, in fact, he was up here for the narrow gauge convention. We knew nothing about the layout, but we walked in. Uh, he had, it was in Reno, I believe it was south of Reno, had a walk-in daylight basement. You walk in, uh, we only have four pictures of it, which I got off the internet, off the Pacific Coast Region website. But you walk in, there's nice scenery, very nicely done. Uh, he's does Rio Grande, I 
think probably late 40s, early 50s. So I think he has some, yeah, has some steam here. This is Denver Union Station. Uh, pretty good size layout. I don't know the dimensions, but I know Gray got to operate uh, some of the through trains. I work with one of the regular members of his crew. We did some switching around the station. Very nice guy to work with, very informative. I had a great time there. Another couple pictures I found of his layout, so he does still run some steam. And as we were getting ready to go, Jim said, we need to see this other guy's layout. He's also in Reno. He's a former SPUP engineer. I'm not sure if he's still an engineer, he's retired. I can't remember what he told us. His name is Jim Price. So Jim called Jim. We set up a time for us to go by and us, and I think somebody else from our session found the place out in the country and went there. Okay, so Jim says this is the biggest layout he's ever seen. So we see this room here. This is around Oakland, California, very nicely done. Room off the side, this is the Oakland Mall. For those who don't know, back in earlier times, Southern Pacific tr transcontinental trains would tie up here before the bridges were built. And then the passengers would get on ferries to go over to San Francisco. Okay, I'm thinking this is very nice, but it's not the largest railroad I've ever seen. Then we went to the third room. This, I think, is only about two thirds of it. I don't know the dimensions of the room. I know it's huge. Uh, he's modeling Southern Pacific from Oakland, at least as far as Roseville, I can't remember. He was going anywhere further. He has stocked in there. So I guess it goes up the Altamont and route and up the valley to Sacramento. Here is the uh, Roseville icing facility, which is gone now, but I've seen pictures of it. I'm sure he might have condensed it, but it looks very accurate. Really nice guy. We talked for several a few hours with him, and he's going to have it on several levels, as you see there. And it's you know, I don't, I don't know what he, he told us. Oh, some, I think he must be retired. He said, some days I work on it a couple hours, some days all day. I don't know if he'll ever get it done. Maybe it's one of those where the journey is worth more than the destination. But <laughs> it was impressive. Warehouse or gymnasium size, whatever you want to say it. So the last segment I'm going to talk about we call the what's been called the revived Virginian Trucking Railroad. A fellow by the name of Bob Gray, who we talked a little bit about before the presentation, some year here. He was on the last uh, fan trip up to up on the Virginia City Line, 1937 or something like that. And I guess he always dreamed about reviving that line up there. So somehow he got the financing and the energy. 1976, he started rebuilding from. Virginia, Virginia City on down. But a little bit, bit each year, as I mentioned, he acquired that Darnell Russellville number eight. He ran it one year. He renumbered it number 28, because that would have been the next engine in the series of the VNT. Um, he later acquired this engine here, which was off a railroad in Oregon. Um, I can't remember what it was, but I saw something. Some of you might be familiar with dance and post a lot of pictures online told how this engine uh, apparently went out of service but just kept in the engine house, was never put into park or went to a tourist railroad and was acquired somewhere down in Medford. It was acquired by Bob Gray in the 70s, rebuilt. It's been in service up there for way over 30 years. And uh, they do use some old WP cabooses and gongs to haul the passengers in. Now, one thing I want to, a couple things I want to mention, when Bob started building, he got down a little bit each time. They got as far as Gold Hill. There are two tunnels in the way. One they're able to rebuild. The other, it just was never stable. They had to build a track called a shoe fly around it. And they got as far as Gold Hill. They wanted to go further, but meanwhile, as early as I got associated with that group in the 90s, there was a move to rebuild the VNT down in Carson City. One reason was there's not a lot of uh, there's no hotels. Well, there's one now, but not much parking in Carson's in Virginia City. People hop the train in Carson City. 
come up to Virginia City, spend the day, spend some money, take the train back down. They finally got it built probably eight, nine years ago. First class track all the way. They acquired a 2A2 number 18 former McLeod River engine. They got some old steel coaches. They rebuilt them to look like older coaches. And mm -hmm. I went to get tickets for us to ride and there was nothing available. I thought, well, I guess it's sold out. So we went to where they are, it's not in Carson City, it's outside. They have a group that does the rail bikes there. And lady explained, oh, they're not running. Why they didn't run 4th of July weekend, who knows, but anyway. But the uh, revived Virginian truckie they ran, or the we call it the VNT. Uh, Bob Gray has since passed away, but his family still owns it. Tom Gray, I believe, is the president of it now. So this is just getting ready. They go down below Gold Hill. Uh, they stop. They do narration, show you where the mines were, and they head back, back up the hill. They just do a, a push pull. They don't do a run around there. This is the old Gold Hill Station. It is original probably from the 1870s. It stood all these years. This is a train leaving again with uh, two former WP cabooses, which I believe were emergency ones built during World War II and one gone. I shot this picture just to give you the idea if you've never been in Nevada, this is what it looks like. Not a lot of trees. Mines, remainders of mines, tailing piles all over the place. And again, this is just leaving Gold Hill. Another shot of them going. And I think the steepest grade on this whole line is just as they're approaching here. I don't know the percentage of the grade, but it is, per, is very steep. You can really hear them working up here just with these three cars. Here's a shot of the 29 up in uh, Virginia City. I want to get a shot of the fireman's side. They do have a little uh, G44 tonner they run on the weekday for their excursions, for their tourist trips. Here we have the mayor of Virginia City out walking his pet on a Sunday afternoon. A couple of cabooses, which I believe are former uh, Western Pacific older ones. Now we found this engine down at Gold Hill and uh, I'm quite sure this was the Santa Maria Valley number 100. In fact, I know for sure it was. It was operated on a tourist railroad in Northern Arizona in the late 60s. And then it went to uh, Heber City, Utah, where it ran, I think it ran back there for a while on the, called the Heber Creeper. When they downsized their operation, uh, this engine went to the Fred Kempner collection, some of you may be aware of, and it was stored in Merrill, Oregon for several years. And after Mr. Kempner passed away, this equipment's all been sold off and I see they got a hold of it. And it'll be a good second engine for them. I think it's like a 70 or 80 tonner. I believe they said, I did some, looked on the internet before this presentation. I think it's a 1924 Baldwin. Okay, as we wind up, I think I mentioned that when I was a kid, we would sometimes go up to Carson City. I get to get up in the cab of the Glenbrook, have my picture taken. And I often thought if they ever restore the Glenbrook, I'm gonna try to get down there to get my picture taken in the cab. Well, we got down there. Uh, first thing in the morning, the first day we were there, this gentleman, I can't remember his name, a really nice guy, he was watching the fire. I walked over and he was, hey, come on up. Oh, can I have my picture taken? Oh yeah, and Greg was off doing something else. I hear, Greg, get over here, you know, right now before he changes his mind. As you can see, uh, the engine looks a lot better. I don't know if I look better. I've gained a few pounds and grown a few inches, but. <laughs> so it's kind of neat when you get older, things kind of come full circus, full, full, full circle. So this is the end of our presentation. Here's the SP-401 at the end of the train. Questions? Hi, Scott, I got one. When was, when was the, I was there, 
my wife and I um, went to went to Reno and we took a side trip up to Virginia City. So this was like 1980. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the line was was I mean, they were just started. It was really short. Yeah. When did they finally get the line all the way up to downtown Virginia City proper? It still doesn't go. Oh, you mean Virginia City or Gold Hill? Oh, OK. So the so the. The rails are, how far are they extended from Gold Hill? Oh, or you mean up, up towards Virginia City? Up towards Virginia City, yes. Up to the St. Mary's Church. Okay. The, yeah, there used to be, there was a tunnel that went right in front of the church. On the other side is the old freight station, which is still there. And the little museum where the 27 is. And I guess for some reason they haven't reopened that tunnel. They only go as far as, and there's another building there. It's weird. It's perpendicular to the tracks. That was also a passenger depot. And I think when I was there 30 years ago, it was closed, but it's open now. I, I wish I would have closed the picture of it. Okay. So, so up to the church. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? Anybody oh, want Scott. to go back? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Scott, you'd mentioned the, the original passenger depot, uh, one that's still there, just where the end of track at this point. Um, that was purchased probably 20-ish years ago by uh, Dr. McNary and his wife, and they restored it as a, as a residence, uh, okay. including rebuilding the 20 or so feet on the east end that had been removed umpteen years before. And when they reached uh, need to move along age, uh, they sold it to the Gray family, which is now their passenger depot. Mm -hmm. And it's a neat building. Was it actually a passenger depot one time for the VNT? Yes, it was the original passenger depot. And okay, that's good. When they first it. first started the railroad, they didn't figure they were going in any further, and they realized real quick with the Convy and the Ofer on the other side of St. Mary's that they desperately needed to get to those two mines as well as having their passenger depot a little bit closer to downtown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you look at the maps, they had tracks all over the Virginia City area one time. Oh, yeah. For anybody yeah. who's really into the Virginia and Truckee, there's three good books. One is the uh, Steam Cars, the Stomp, Comstock by B.B. and Clay, and actually B.B. and Clay lived in Virginia City, probably in the 1940s, and their private car, the Gold Coast, which now on display in the California State Railroad Museum, that was based in Carson City. And when they wanted to take it out, the V&T would haul it up to uh, Reno where they'd catch an SP train, probably at the end of a train. And then uh, Ted Worm wrote his book probably about 30 years ago. Ted Worm, I believe, was on one of the last probably the last fan trip up to Virginia City. Or I don't know if he was on that trip, but I guess when he was a kid, he spent his summers with his uncle in Carson City and he reported that he was on the last freight train up to Gold Hill, which was number 11, and he picked up a boxcar of concentrates to haul down. Yeah. And Mallory Hope Farrell wrote the third book, which actually there's another book also, but the third one, which I've had a while. I don't even think I've had time to even look through it yet, but there's a lot, it's very well uh, documented. Then the symposium they have every year, I, I can't make it down that anymore, but they have a lot of good presentations there. So I just, uh, this is Paul, I just went online to, uh, to see about, you know, where this uh, St. Mary's Church was. And apparently, well, it, it pictures that, that show online, it's a fabulous structure, but oh, yeah. it looks as though it, it They've got a museum there as well that talks about what life was like in uh, the you know 1860s and 70s when the Comstock was mm -hmm. uh, was booming there. So that might be a, a good side trip if you're visiting uh, that area because it it would give you some some background. I'm sure on not only the railroads but the uh, uh, the whole business with the with the mining. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever read the book called. Uh, the the men that met the mountains or that made the mountains anyway it's uh 
it's a really interesting history book and it talks about the settling of, of Colorado, uh, Utah, Nevada, and California, and has quite a bit uh, to say about this part of the world at, back at that point in time. Yeah, there's several museums there. Greg and I went into one. I can't remember the name of it. We had a lot of displays, very complete one. I think there's a museum in the old schoolhouse there. Uh, yes. I remember going in the St. Mary's Church when I was up there as a kid, like in 1964, you could go in there. Went in what was called the Graves Mansion, the Piper's Opera House. And those buildings are all still there. It's also just like a big party area down there on the main drag there. <laughs> say, saying that nicely. <laughs> it, it was a very hot day and it wasn't, I think if you want to go there, maybe go when it's cooler, I don't know. <laughs> it's an interesting side trip. <laughs> if you go off season, you're going to miss the outhouse races down the middle of the street. So. And, and the camel races. Yes. <laughs> Hey, Scott. Yeah. Scott. Yes. Uh, did you go to uh, the KDY when you was down here at Potola? No, we didn't. And uh, that's quite a ways down on Highway 70. Yeah. I actually, I actually do not know how to get there. Now, All we, the years I live in California, I only went up Highway 70 once. Yeah, it wasn't that far from Potola. Uh, when we went down to Pasadena to the National Narrow Gauge Convention, we stopped there in Potola, and then we went to KDY, and also we start stopped at the, uh, uh, was it uh, the Nevada County Museum there too? Right. That was both places I really enjoyed them, and the KDY is a good train washing place. <laughs> I don't know how many trains we watched go by when we was there. Yeah, it's very very busy there. I don't know how many. They set up through the inside gateway anymore, but they can do that too, besides the ones going east. Yeah, you know, Mark Clemens and I, we went down there to Pasadena to the... Okay, good, good um, presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the book that I was uh, mentioning is called Men to Match My Mountain by Irving Stone. Hmm. He's the same guy that wrote The Agony and the Ecstasy. So, oh, wow. high quality author. Yeah. And uh, Greg, more, right? Oh, yes. One more, one more thing on the on the back of uh, steam cars to the Comstock. When uh, uh, BB and Clegg were in Virginia City, they uh, acquired ownership of the territorial enterprise mm -hmm. and tried to keep that John going. Price, you're talking, but you must be muted. I'm sorry. I can hear you, John. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, BB and Clegg, territorial, territorial enterprise when they were uh, in Virginia City. John Price, you're muted. Now he's waiting for an answer. Somebody's oh. waiting for an answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, John. I, yeah, thank you, John. Yeah. Okay. And that was uh, Samuel Clemens' work there, mm -hmm. also known as Mark Twain. That one museum had a lot about him. Interesting area. And Greg, Greg could tell you a lot about the mining, much, much more than I can. But the type of mining they did, I can't remember what they called those large rooms where they would mine. They would just build these framework of timbers to hold it up and for the miners to work. And as I said earlier, there's got to be a couple of forests of timbers buried in those mountains up there. Yep, they're and they're all underwater now. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Don't touch anything.
try one of the other ones. Get it, Cap. You can see how many people were at this event. A relatively small area. There were a lot of rail fans crammed in there, and there was stuff happening. There.